I'm looking at you, carnivore pushes, vegan pushes, raw foodies pushes, breatharian pushes, fruitarian pushes, insert, open bracket, any restrictive diet, close bracket, follow it by pusher, and I'm looking at you. And when I say pushes, I don't mean anyone who's vegan, carnivore, fruitarian, going about their day, you're fine. I talk about the quote-unquote gurus who are trying to convert everybody. That's the pusher. Welcome back. We are on. Today on the Tool for Dish It podcast, I'm Angie S, the founder of Angie S.com, where I'm a women's health advocate, expert, and coach, where I help you become in charge of your health and in turn feel and look younger as a result. Link in the show notes. If you want to work with me, you can get in touch via the website or email me directly at hello at angie-s.com. Please, 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 please don't forget to rate, review, subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow it on Spotify or for all the other platforms, whichever way you show love is how you can support this show. And it is free for you to do. Free, free, free. I can't say the R's in English, but you know what I mean. So today is just you and me. Just you and me today. So I want to talk about trending diets. Trending diets are a huge topic with so many levels to them. So today does not cover everything, but it will give you some ammo next time someone is trying to push you into a way of life that you may not feel is right for you and also empower you a bit more as what to consider when picking certain lifestyles. So I will back this up with some science and also where the quote unquote gurus fail us and give you some practical examples of how this looks like with real life examples. And if you're worried it'll be boring science, don't worry, it won't. You will have some ammo for your annoying friends who are all trying you to convince you to do the same diet as them. Plus the words snooch and topless do come up in the episode. And yes, it is relevant. (laughs) So (laughs) let's begin. Our bodies can survive famine and even cancer. So yes, It can survive on a restrictive diet too. But are we thriving on them? Can we all thrive on the same restricted diet? That's the differentiating point. So today we'll go over four different pillars to explain this. One is thriving versus surviving. Two, the extremists. Three, our ancestors and what it means genetically. And four, I finish up with the mental health implication of all of this. Let's begin. Some of us are supposed to be vegetarians. Example, those suffering from gout or hemochromatosis. But if that's not you, lucky. Just think, is this new trending diet in the media truly what's best for you at this time in your life? Is it truly what's best for your body and lifestyle? For some, it'll be a yes, 100% yes, for others, it'd be an issue. So if you choose a lifestyle out of principle, spiritual or religious belief, then go for it 100%. I won't stop you. But if you do it because you want to up-level your health, then this is what I want you to know before you decide on joining any particular trends. The body can survive on famine, cancer, etc. So if you didn't have time for your smoothie this morning, you will be a-okay. Okay? So if we can survive on famine, surviving on a vegan diet is not the question here. Stop showing us pictures of people who are 9,900 years old vegans. We get it. My question is, is it healthy for everyone? Not can you survive on it? Can you thrive on it? Now, carnivores, don't be smug because I'm looking at you right now and you're next, okay? I like to call the extremists, okay? I have a beef with, and I bet you're not surprised, any groups who are pushing any restricted lifestyles. They are like fundamentalists to me. 
Don't come over here and try and turn down and muzzle our lives, okay? I'm looking at you, carnivore pushes, vegan pushes, raw foodies pushes, breatharian pushes, fruitarian pushes, insert, open bracket, any restrictive diet, close bracket, follow it by pusher, and I'm looking at you. And when I say pushes, I don't mean... Anyone who's vegan, carnival, fruitarian, going about their day, you're fine. I talk about the quote-unquote gurus who are trying to convert everybody. That's the pusher, okay? Food is a drug. If you think pusher is a strong word, try and remove, the, try and remove sugar from your diet. See how easy that is, Okay? And when I say restrictive, I mean restrictive diets that certain groups are pushing as a, as a way to up-level someone's health without them having any medical condition to ground it, like to ground all of these high elimination diets that are push, being pushed on people without having a better understanding of the individual's need, their body's need, and so on. I'm going to explain this to you, okay? So the first one is, <laughs> were our ancestors vegans or carnivores? I don't care. You know why it doesn't matter? You know why it doesn't matter? Evolution. Everybody thinks they have the best diet in the world and that all our ancestors ate one specific diet. Actually, no, we really need to look at where in the world our ancestors were. Because if it was in Greece, Greenland or Kenya, not the same habitat, not the same food choices. And that's, and that's important to know because of the role of genetics in our ability to digest certain foods and its evolution, which is partly influenced by geography, migration and mixing populations. So never mind that, there's also the fact that genetically, we're not the exact same that we were like 10,000 BC. You know, traits from, from, you know, from the above ancestors I mentioned can be lost, maintained or fixed in the population due to evolutionary forces like drift and selection, which I won't get into here, but let, let's just take an, an example that impacts us all today, okay? Dairy and starches. Both get such a bad rap in certain circles. Sometimes there's a good reasons for it and sometimes there just isn't. So I'll explain this. I'm going to explain this now. So we have evolved to digest uh, lactose and starches to different levels of efficiency depending on your heritage, okay? So those things are like uh, dairy and bread, for example, or rice. So some populations have more copies of the genes that produce enzymes to digest lactose and starches. So, for example, there are communities that farmed livestock, those had a significant advantage to digest lactose. And those are, for example, Northern Europe, Middle Eastern and West African countries. And some pastoral Eastern African countries too. So someone who's from Scandinavia and Kenya, for example, will have a, a higher probability to be able to digest lactose because of their ancestors from circa 1410 BC, okay? And just so you know, in genetic time span... This is a trait that emerged recently, meaning that it happened fast. And also it means that before that, we couldn't digest lactose before that trait emerged. See, we're adaptable. Yeah, funny, huh? We're adaptable. And on the other hand, in the Vietnamese population, nearly all adults are lactose intolerant. So we also need to understand that one of the strengths as humans is that we have the ability to be omnivores. So our ancestors adapted, adapted wherever they went when they had a nomadic lifestyle. And so one, cannot try and eat how they did due to genetic evolution. Two, we are omnivores, we adapt. Three, for carnivore diet, which is basically a lot of meat... There is an economic factor to being a, a carnivore, okay? Have you seen how much meat those people eat? One, who's got the money, the freezer space? And do we even have enough grass-fed, non-hormonally induced cows to feed the whole world this way? And I say that, and I'm not even a vegan. So to round up our uh, genetic heritage from our ancestors, in a way, yes, it does matter what our ancestors ate. 
but not in a way that's like a cookie cutter solution that fits everyone. Because if they were from Greece, Greenland or Kenya, there are some variations and we need to be able to customize to your own needs and using discernments is key when we're talking about your health, okay? Very, very important. So when I hear that a vegan diet or a carnivore diet cures autoimmune diseases, we need to leave room for both of them to coexist because one may be true for one person but not the other and vice versa. You know... At the end of the day, if something works for someone, leave them alone. You don't hold the truth. I don't hold the truth. I really don't. No one holds the truth on everything. It's impossible in in this day and age. We're not there yet. Uh, Will we ever be there? I have no idea. Okay? So I want to use an example here that I saw recently that really pissed me off. And... This is not to, I'm not trying to isolate the carnivore diet, but I'm just, this is just an example that came up today. And I, I really want to, I really want to talk about it because it, it did really um, annoy me. Um, and it's basically an example again on those quote unquote gurus who are saying things out of context. <laughs> okay, so it's about gout, carnivore diet. So I'll give you some context here. There's this famous doctor on the internet who, from what I can understand, has been a carnivore for, wait for it, a whole year and a half, which, by the way, is not enough time to know or understand the data or consequences that may arise in the future that his newly adopted lifestyle of being a carnivore full time may have on his health. Anyway. He does look well, though. I mean, he looks good. I checked out his Instagram highlights and stories, and he seems to just love to be topless in his kitchen for no apparent reason, which is so annoying because part of me is turned on and repelled at the same time because it feels like so sleazy and such a desperate move. But he seems sweet at the same time. So I just feel really confused. Okay. Like I think my snooch is betraying me on this. I mean, she does have a mind of her own. Okay. So anyway, back to topic. He's been boasting about, and I'll explain this in a minute, what this means, that his uric acid levels are very low, like very low, like a 4.1, even though he eats three pounds of meat a day, which is 1.5 kilo. It's a lot of meat. And he says that because of that, meat does not cause gout. But actually, maybe eating meat may even prevent gout. Okay, so first of all, 4.1 is not very low. He's normal. Normal uric acid levels are between 2 to 7. So he's fine. He's fine, but not very low, okay? He needs to keep his boxes on. Otherwise, he'd be completely naked. And then I want to know what she'll make me think or do. <sighs> Still, he's annoying. He's so annoying. So he's mixing a couple of things here. When it comes to gout, this is not what we're saying, okay? Because there is a genetic factor. He's likely in the pool of people whose, whose body is highly efficient at excreting uric acids. If you are prone to gout, eating meat will make it worse, okay? That's what the science says today. It may change in five years. It may change in one year. I may be proven wrong. But this is something that he literally said recently, and the science still says that eating meat will make it worse, okay? This is based on what Harvard Medical School says, so I'll go with that. Three, I imagine that it would take a while for uric acid levels to precipitate to such a level that he'd be at risk. And again, the higher the level the uric acid is, the more likely the patient will develop gout, but it does not guarantee it. So it increases risks, but it doesn't make the diagnosis. So I don't even know why he's making a reverse diagnosis of saying just because he's got you know, because he's got a a level that's, you know, average, normal, that he thinks that a carnivore diet will cure gout. I mean, that doesn't really make any sense. That pisses me off. I hope I'm making sense, by the way. Um, I hope I'm making sense. Um, 
So I'm just, I just want to explain this to you. Let's say if you wake up with an inflamed joint, okay? Like, so you wake up with an inflamed joint in your foot and you're in absolute agony. The idea is that a health professional will then measure your uric acid level in the blood, but you need further testing to establish there is gout because you need to see what's called uric acid crystals in the joint along with the inflammation, okay? Uric, like high uric acid levels alone would need further testings and because it will be a different diagnosis at that stage. It wouldn't be gout. Anyway, so all of this to say that He's not far along in his journey to make this absurd fact across the board to say that eating meat prevents gout, in my opinion, you know? So so from what I can get from, you know, whatever he puts out there is that from the information... So so what what I can get from any of the information that he puts out there... So this guy, obviously, full-time carnivore, loves to be naked, showing up, you know, his, his really nice bud and, you know whatever but what it says is that he may be better than average at excreting uric acid from his body okay which again is a genetic factor so that could be one of the reasons and the reason why i'm telling you this is that you cannot you know you you cannot just take a statement like that for god spell like at its best it's inconclusive and annoying And also something else that's important to know is that an association does not mean it's the cause of something, okay? So um, association is not causation. You may have heard that said before. So to say that people, it it will be the same to say like people with fair skin and blonde hair are more prone to skin cancer. It does not mean that all of them will get it. And it definitely does not mean that any other skin or hair color will not get it. So... What he is really saying is that it's the equivalent of someone with hemochromatosis saying they thrive on a vegan diet. Of course they're better on a vegan diet. They have to massively restrict iron intake because they absorb it so much that it can cause life-threatening liver disease, okay? It does not mean that all of us will thrive on a vegan diet, okay? Like, you know what I'm saying? It's like you just, you know, it, what is good for one person doesn't mean it's good for all. And that's why I think it's important to use the discernment is that if you hear someone go, well, I've tried this and it was amazing and I live so well. You need to look at why it's good for them. Okay. It may not be right for you and don't beat yourself up if it is not right for you. So I want to finish up this episode with the mental health side of things uh, when it comes to restricted diet (laughs) you know another reason (laughs) so many reasons to be annoyed today but another reason why I'm so annoyed with any restricted diets and I know I I, I did like a big big you know rant on carnivore but I, I thought I'll just use one as an example but it actually goes across the board to be honest um, any restrictive diets are being pushed, pushed, pushed so hard. Those moving movements are often meshed with the idea of clean eating. And with quote-unquote clean eating, unfortunately, they can enable eating disorders. Okay, they can trigger eating disorders as well. So not for all, but for enough people for it to be a problem... And a reason, another reason why it should not be pushed so hard on the masses through the media or any other means, when you don't know who you have in front of you, you don't know what that person's body's needs are based on their genetic landscape, lifestyle, age. We don't all thrive, and again I say thrive, not survive, on the same lifestyles, okay? So... I find that those who push their agenda as the only healthy option for everyone, and I mean everyone, when they make that statement, I'm sure they mean well. You know, it's not, I don't think people are are malicious or evil when they do it. But it is misinformed and dangerous. And as you know now, not everyone is meant to be on the same type of diet. 
due to genetic predispositions, lifestyle, age. Those are unique. You, those are unique to you, as the individual. And so, honestly, I think like restrictive diet pushers are like fundamentalists. Like they're right, and everyone else is wrong. Okay, like you know, I. You know, I've been that person to to be on very restricted diets. You know, I think they're, they're right in certain circumstances. I think they can be very good at certain stages in your life and, 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 and when done correctly. But I think when they're pushed like just blindly across the board uh, without any discernment and proper education on how to do it properly, then that's a problem. That's actually another thing that I wanted to do, but... It's just, you know, I don't want to like overload you, but I, I, you know, I could do, you know, there, there are ways of how to, for example, vegans, how to absorb iron, you know, much better. And it's not just a matter of just getting a B12 supplement, you know, um, that's not enough. Um, so, so yeah, just make sure when you're out there, use the sermon, make sure you're doing it right, get the, get the proper information. So... Well, that's our episode. (laughs) I hope this has been useful for you. Any questions, please let me know. You can get in touch by the website at angie-nest.com. I've revamped it a bit. And by revamping, I mean deleted most of it uh, to make it just a lot less pages. So if you have a look, let me know your thoughts. I I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Please don't forget to rate, review, subscribe on iTunes or follow on Spotify for all the other platforms. Whichever way you show love is how you can show support to this show and it's free for you to do. Uh, Drop me your questions or suggestions for future episodes via the website at angie-finesse.com. You can come and find me on Instagram. I have two accounts. One is at Tool for Dish It Podcast and the other one is at Not Too Old 4 with the number 4. Link in the show notes. See you next week and until then. Using health inappropriately.